What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoOp video. In this video, I'm going to be putting together a budget system that you can actually build in 2022. A PC Prime for entry-level 1080p gaming in titles like Overwatch, Fortnite, Warzone and CSGO. In this video, I'll be guiding you through all the component choices for a build like this, discussing how future-proof this system is as well, assembling the PC step-by-step step, and booting it up later to see just how well it performs in those games I just mentioned. Can you really build a 1080p gaming PC for under five or six hundred dollars? I guess it's time to find out. When it comes to building any gaming PC, there are seven core components everyone needs to buy. These include your case and power supply to house and power the system, a motherboard, memory and storage to keep everything nicely ticking over, a GPU to power those all important games, and at the heart, kind of the brain in a PC like this, the CPU. This right here is Intel's Core i3-12100F a new budget release from Intel that resembles more Ryzen 5 performance than it does the i3s we've come to expect. I'll be pairing it up in this system with a B660 motherboard from Asus, their Prime B660MA D4. This is one of the more entry-level B660 boards on the market. You can go cheaper and go for a lower chipset once again, but with four RAM DIMM slots, support for the latest super fast SSDs, and of course PCIe Gen 4 support for the latest RTX GPUs later down the line, it covers all of the bases we're going to need. When it comes to a motherboard, you don't want to go so cheap on the board that you haven't got any future upgrade options. And make sure you pick up something from Asus, MSI or Gigabyte that has a decent amount of features. This board comes with all the key features that we're going to need, including four RAM DIMM slots for dual channel upgradable memory, PCIe Gen 4 for super fast NVMe drives, and of course that all important powerful PCIe slot for high end GPUs, say an RTX 30. 60 or 70 later down the line. This is certainly a simple motherboard, but who said simple had to be a bad thing? Not me, it wasn't me. And what we're gonna do for the next stage is we're going to install the CPU into the motherboard. Now this is actually fairly easy. You want to take the processor out and find the golden triangle in the bottom left corner. Match this up with the triangle on your CPU socket, lift up the retention arm, drop the chip in gently to place and pop the socket back down. Your black cover will fly off and that's basically it as far as the processor goes. Once the process is in, we can then move on to the cooler. Now, I've opted to stick with the Intel stock cooler. It's been much improved over some of the last gen designs, looks pretty cool as well this time around, and we'll do a nice job of keeping our CPU cool. Typically, this will come with pre-applied thermal paste, but because our cooler has been used before, I need to just drop on a dab of our own to create the nice thermal bond between the CPU and our CPU cooler. And then we can grab the cooler itself by placing it on top of the CPU, and these four plastic posts will clip in nicely to the holes on the motherboard. It's a completely tallest design, making this stage of the build really, really easy. We can then go ahead and wrap up the motherboard assembly as it's called by installing the last component into the board outside the case. This right here is the storage, Seagate's Barracuda 510. Available in either 500 gig or one terabyte capacities, both are a good choice, but if you wanna save some money, the 500 gig drive is not a bad shout. More capacities sort of your thing, go ahead and pick up the one terabyte version. This will be installed nicely under the little included M.2 heatsink, which will pop back on, not only securing the drive in place, but also helping to keep Keep temperatures nice and low. With the motherboard assembly nicely wrapped up, we can now go ahead and transfer the whole thing into the case choice. Ready, set, go. In particular for this build, I've gone for a snazzy budget unit from Techware, a brand that specialises in making fantastic value cases. This particular model is a micro ATX chassis, making it nice and small, nice and compact, and perfect for an on-desk gaming setup. 
This chassis is also available with either a white or black interior, allowing you to go more traditional or to get something that just stands out that little bit more for a build like this one. It really helps set the system off and gives it a little bit more of a wow factor than if we went for an all black chassis. I'm gonna lay the case down flat on our desk and then you'll be able to see it on our overhead camera angle, making the next stage of the build a lot, lot easier. For this stage in particular, you need to take the IO shield from your motherboard's box. That's this rectangular piece of metal and this is gonna click in to the rear of the case. Be careful you don't cut your fingers, hence the plaster on mine. <laughs> and we can do this by just sliding it in. Three circular dots at the bottom. There we go. Click it into place. Makes a nice, lovely, satisfying click sound. I'm scared of the last bit. There we go. Now that's in. And we can slide the motherboard in after. But wait, there is one more thing we need to check. And that's that the holes through the motherboard match up with the standoffs in the case. You can see on our board, we've got three at the top. We've then got three along the middle and a further two down the bottom. In this instance, everything was already in the right place, but you should really double check in your case, as if you don't move these, you can cause some pretty catastrophic damage to your system. And trust me, that's not a hyperbole. You can then go ahead and fasten the motherboard down and that will make sure it's not going anywhere. I've just realized though, looking at the motherboard, we haven't done the RAM yet. Uh, so let's rewind the moment. <laughs> Install our RAM kit today, which is a lovely DDR4 16 gig kit from Corsair. And then we'll resume with the screwing of the motherboard into place. I'm losing my marbles once again. You guys have officially made me lose my marbles! Ready, set, go. Heads up, dropping the pain. Shiny new. For the next stage of the build, I'm gonna go ahead and install the GPU. One of the most exciting components in a gaming PC and probably the most controversial component in this video, Nvidia's GeForce GT 10. 30. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. James, a GT 1030, that can't game. James, isn't a GT 1030 a 720p card? James, have you lost your marbles for the second time in this video? Marbles! Hasn't even got two fan cooler. It's it's tiny. Really? Yes. Now, for the right kind of titles, the GT 1030 is actually a very viable option. And don't just believe me, take a look at some of these benchmarks on your screen now. Overwatch anyone? At some really competitive frame rates. CSGO, Valorant, all games that are gonna perform very well on this GPU, which you can often find for under $100. The latest pricing and availability will be at the affiliate links in the description below. Now, I'm not saying this is an ideal gaming solution. And if you're looking to play Cyberpunk 2077 at 60fps, Yes, with ray tracing, it's not gonna happen. But if you're looking for a 1080p esports card to keep you going until mainstream GPUs like the 3050 and 3060 come back in stock, it's a decent shout and certainly a much better value option than paying $250 plus for the new Radeon 6500 XT because we all know what happened with that one. We'll be diving into more detailed benchmarks a little bit later though, so do hold out. Basically, it's a good stopgap measure until, as I say, those more mainstream cards come back in stock. And this build is ready to be upgraded. It's ready for a 3050 or 3060 and not going to bottleneck those cards at 1080 or 1440p even. We're gonna push back the clip on our PCI slot and then install our diddy little video card, tiny, tiny, tiny. You do need a proper PCI slot for this though, not one of those mini versions. And that's basically it. Make sure you pick up a GDDR5 and not a DDR4 card as the GDDR5s, a lot of Ds are much quicker than memory, way more bandwidth, way more snappy and is gonna make a big difference in gaming. Remember, memory is the whole problem with the 6500 XT and a reason you shouldn't spend more than $200 on that card. Let's get this installed though, and then we can wrap our budget build up by looking at the power supply. With upgradability at the top of my mind, the power supply was always a little bit of a tricky choice. In the end, I settled for this Cooler Master 500 watt. It's very basic, though it does have an 80 plus certification and enough wattage for something like a 3050. If you wanted to go higher end than that on the GPU, I'd recommend a 650 watt unit. But for now, this will work well. And I managed to pick it up for like less than $50, making it a really great power supply, even if we have to swap it out in a year or two's time when making upgrades to the system. The last thing you wanna do is pick up an 850 watt unit now, spend more than triple the price, and then end up not needing it 
ever because it's just a huge, huge waste of money. And money that could more importantly go into some of the other components in the build. We're going to slide the power supply into the rear of the case. This case supports standard full-size ATX power supplies, which is pretty important for those of you shopping on a budget. And screws in with four screws, as you'd expect. Once the unit's installed, we just need to run a few cables, one to the motherboard, and then one to the CPU. And while we're here, we'll finish off the front panel cables too. That's plugging up the small fiddly connectors that power the power and reset switches, USB 3 ports, and your audio jacks. But I'll pop all the diagrams and all the examples on your screen to make things nice and easy. And then once you've done that, we can boot the system up and test out the performance of our pokey little 1030. Is it really good enough for 1080p gaming in 2022? I guess we're about to find out. After an epic glam montage of this system all powered up and lit up with all of its RGB goodness. I'll see you in a second, but first, roll that montage. <laughs> just how good this budget machine, and it really is a budget machine, looks when it's all booted up, it's time to see if the performance is actually any good. We tested a wide range of titles. Now, of course, the 1030 is not made for Cyberpunk. It's not made for Halo Infinite or Battlefield 2042. The sweet spot lies with Overwatch, CSGO, Valorant, and Fortnite. Esports-oriented titles where we can still achieve that all-important 60 FPS. So let's see just how close we got. In our first game and test, GTA 5. Here we received some pretty impressive results actually. Running the game in benchmark run at 1080p low looked visually okay and gave us a decent frame rate. 70 frames on average to be precise. The 90 and 99th percentiles were strong and as always we tested our frame rate with both Nvidia FrameView and MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner for maximum fairness. Moving on to Valorant next up, and we tested at 1080p medium settings. Here we got over 150 FPS, and we did so quite comfortably. 90 and 99 were good as well, and the game visually at 1080p medium looked really good. Next up is Fortnite. Here we tested at 1080p competitive settings. We managed to pull in a really respectable frame rate that wasn't quite where I'd like it, but still over 55 frames per second. Fortnite is definitely pushing the limits of what the 1030 is capable of, but you can definitely play and get respectable results in Fortnite, and that's the bit that really matters. Overwatch is a similar story. At 1080p, we managed to pull in more than 60 frames per second on average, another game where we hit that all-important 60 frames per second mark, while CSGO, which is next up on the list, gave us well over 100 frames per second. Wow. When it comes to the 1030, it's all about playing the right kind of titles. If you're a fan of the latest, most intense AAA titles, it's not the card for you. But if esports oriented games as a stopgap measure while the market improves are what you're looking for, the 1030 might just deliver. And on that note, that pretty much wraps it up for today's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.